Okay, so um, great. So this uh, is a session where uh, we are asking the question, how can we uh, bridge the gap between indigenous knowledge and devolved local government decision-making? Um, again, I'm Tom Smucker um, from Ohio University and I'll serve as the session facilitator. I'm also involved in uh, the research from uh, one of our pre presenters. Uh, and I'm joined today by um, a set of contributors um, who are going to take on this question and to provide us uh, their perspective and their experiences um, coming from different organizations and different national and local contexts in which they work. And all of them, I believe I've made co-hosts, so they should be able to share uh, once I'm done with my, my short intro. Um, but beyond our, our uh, contributors, um, I also have seen uh, you know, that we have a, a really uh, great group of, of participants as well. And so um, we're excited to get your uh, perspectives. And so we'll have a, a more interactive forum after the opening uh, presentations. Um, we'll do a, a, a breakout um, discussion and, 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 and try to um, get a handle on, on your experiences as well. It's really important that we hear a lot of different voices in this discussion uh, because it seems that this question about local and indigenous knowledge in the, the practice and, and indeed research on adaptation is a, a very long-standing issue. It's one that has been talked about for uh, really for, for decades. And increasingly, I think we hear practitioners speaking to the notion that local knowledge systems are, are very dynamic, right? They're not sort of static um, and that they are, um, they are evolving in interaction um, with external knowledge systems. And so there are discussions around uh, integration of local and external uh, knowledge systems questions about the power dynamics and power relationships, um, the wider institutional and cultural context in which knowledge claims are staked out and in which visions and aspirations for the future and for, for you know, what, what we come to think of as, as adaptation to climate change, uh, that those are articulated. So I'm very excited to hear about examples today in which local knowledge systems are centered in adaptation but also uh, examples in, in which um, the, the gap still remains to be, to be bridged, right? In which, um, uh, in which local knowledge or indigenous knowledge systems uh, remain on the margins and some of the challenges for uh, trying to build points of contact between uh, local and indigenous knowledge systems and adaptation practice. So I'm gonna allow the, um, presenters to introduce um, themselves. Let me give you a quick overview of where we're going with this, um, uh, with this session. So we're going to start with um, short uh, opening statements or, or short presentations from our um, three sets of contributors. So um, uh, Lori and Steve from Makeway, um, Dorote and Stefan from Friendship, and then uh, Martin, who will speak about our, our research in Kenya. So we're going from Canada to Bangladesh to, to Kenya. And then we go to uh, breakout groups. So we've got a set of three breakout groups and you'll be allowed to uh, select the group that, that you enter. And we're gonna do some brainstorming around specific questions that our contributors will uh, suggest. When we reconvene, we'll do a quick Mentimeter poll or kind of crowdsourcing of, uh, of uh, ideas around, um, around what prevents uh, this kind of the centering of indigenous and local knowledge systems to happen in adaptation. And we'll, he we'll hear uh, kind of a recap from um, breakout group rapporteurs. So that's a, a quick overview of, of where we're heading. So, um, Without cutting too much uh, more into the, uh, the discussion time, the presentation time, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and hand the baton over to Lori and Steve uh, from Makeway um, for their uh, presentation on Arctic uh, Indigenous knowledge and local decision making. So welcome, Lori and Steve. 
Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lori Tegungna with Makeway Foundation. Uh, I'm calling in from Iqalui Nunavut. Um, my role focuses on grant making and relationship building across Inuit Nunangat in the Canadian Arctic. Um, and then I'll pass it over to Steve. Hi there, I'm Steve Ellis. Uh, I'm in Yellowknife, Northwest Territories in the subarctic regions of Canada, uh, quite a bit west of where Laurie is located. Uh, I lead um, Makeway's Northern Program, which works across the northern subarctic and arctic regions of Canada, um, primarily where Inuit peoples live, as well as Northern First Nations or um, uh, the other major Indigenous group in Canada. Um, Lori is going to take this presentation away and then I'll uh, bring it on. Just to confirm on the format, um, sorry, are we starting our presentation now or are all the panelists introducing themselves first? Sorry, uh, yeah, you, you can, uh, I think it's best just to go ahead with the presentation and then the others will introduce themselves uh, before their presentations. So. Thank you. Okay, sounds okay. good. Um, yeah, I'll... we're good. I could start. Yeah, you want me to share? Thomas, would be better if uh, we share, share the screen or you? What's your preference? Uh, I think you could share the screen, Steve. I think you were just. Okay, you can see it. Yeah. Yes. Let me get really nice stuff. photos, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you just tell me when you want me to advance, Lori. Okay, sounds good. Um, anyway, first of all, I want to say thank you for inviting us. Um, and also thank you for dedicating time to speak about this, um, like the focus of the session is how do we, how do we honor and value indigenous knowledge systems with the regard that they deserve how do we hold space for them? How do we integrate them? So like, I think it's important to designate time, effort, resources into setting up spaces like this. So I think this is a good start. And as we were preparing for this, I was thinking like, which way can we approach this? how can we think about indigenous knowledge systems, but also how can, we, how can we use these systems as well as other knowledge systems to create more accurate, fuller pictures and make the best decisions based on the best available knowledge information data. And when I think about that, like there's our ecological science or there's these other efforts for monitoring and data collection and understanding what is what is the state of the environment oftentimes this tells us very objective truths whereas indigenous knowledge systems often are about how do you act in this world how do you behave how do you live in this world um, so in short, science says what is, indigenous knowledge says how to be. And so with the work that we support in environmental monitoring and stewardship, oftentimes indigenous groups are utilizing both systems. Um, and so like this, this concept really excites me because ultimately we care about our environment. We wanna safeguard our resources. Like how do we do this? We utilize science and also we utilize indigenous knowledge systems. And like when I think about the power and the value of knowledge systems, these are ancient truths. Like they've been built upon generation upon generation and they tell us about like the natural cycles of the earth, of our environment. Um, and like, I think sometimes we forget how, how deep and vast these truths are and like the great value that comes with them. Um, and like within the North, 
like land and sea activities, like they're still very much like crucial or like foundational to our way of living and being. And hunters and harvesters, they are people who are experiencing the environment almost every day. They're the ones that are paying attention. They're the ones that carry the stories of our grandparents. Um, so we see hunters and harvesters as being like key knowledge keepers. Um, if we could move on to the next slide, Steve. Um, and like I was saying, like, just as knowledge carriers in the past had these deep relationships, hunters and harvesters today like continue the relationship. They continue interact to interact with the environment and they have these intimate relationships with all the beings and even the non-living like elements of the environment. Um, like I've heard some folks regard different elements of the environment as extensions of their family and they extend the same care they would for their siblings as they would for the environment. Um, next slide, Steve. And then I'll pass it over to Steve to continue. Thanks, Lori. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, just following on what Laurie was, was describing as the value of indigenous knowledge in creating Arctic uh, communities and environments. Um, the preservation and the transmission of that knowledge is something that's absolutely critical to making sure that knowledge base, not only the knowledge base, but that base of values and ethics and um, the ways of being in relationship to land and water and animals are transmitted through generations. And so that stewardship ethic for care of environment, care of land, care of animals transmits as well. So it's not just knowledge about how the world or the environment works, it's knowledge about how we must behave in relation to that environment. And that's the key critical component of indigenous knowledge that, um, well, we'll reflect on a little bit later, that often is the piece that's disregarded in local decision making. What we've seen across the Canadian Arctic, uh, in, indeed Canada, um, over the past number of years, of years has been a, a resurgence in, in formalized programming at the community level, um, built around enabling and amplifying hunters, harvesters, or stewards to go out and take care of their lands, to harvest, provide food security solutions to their communities, um, to monitor environmental change and so on. So these are often called guardian programs or ranger programs and so on and so forth. And we know that there's other countries in the world that have similar sorts of programs. For example, Australia, which has a very robust Aboriginal ranger program called the Working on Country Program. In Canada, there's a real movement to, to build these sorts of livelihoods and to formalize long-term programs um, that not only build livelihoods and jobs at the community level, but really honor the knowledge and skills of indigenous peoples to caretake, watch, and, and receive benefit from the lands and waters in which they live. Um, so this, we're in the early days of these sorts of programs. This is uh, some one of the uh, programs that uh, we work with up in the northern regions of Baffin Islands and in the high Arctic community of Arctic Bay. This program is called uh, the Nautic Suktit, which as far as I understand means essentially those who care for or watch over the land. So while there's um, lots of depth of indigenous knowledge about how to um, be in relation to the land and water, and as well as those long-standing intergenerational truths on how the water and land and, and animals are and behave, there remain very significant challenges to bring this knowledge into decision-making and ultimately influencing policy and programs. Um, some of those barriers include the, 
uh, the fact that indigenous knowledge is often only considered valid when verified by Western science. So um, I don't know how many times Laura and I have been in rooms where it's like, hey, this, you know, what these elders have told us is right because we've done a, a scientific study that proved what they said was right, that narwhals do pass through this strait at this time of year. We went out and did a scientific study to confirm that. So instead of honoring the knowledge systems at face value for the val for the the depth of um, uh, data and information that they bring to bear, rather there's often an effort to to verify or validate that information using Western scientific means, which from our perspective is a big waste of time and money. And if we just sort of understand that these systems are valid in and of itself, we don't have to extend the resources to to validate using Western scientific means. Uh, the other fundamental challenge, which I'm sure is a global challenge, is that the policy and decision-making forms are ultimately ingrained in Western European customs and processes. So while elders and land users and indigenous peoples may have really important knowledge to share, they ultimately need to bring that knowledge into decision-making systems, which are founded in Western bureaucratic ways of knowing and doing. And so the entry points for those, those uh, knowledge systems into these, frankly, foreign um, uh, policy making forums or decision making forums, uh, the fit is not very good. Uh, one, one simple example is language. Uh, often the, the best um, elders and land users speak their indigenous language and which holds a whole bunch of nuance and value and the ability to translate that nuance and value into um, often English or French in, in Canada anyway, decision making forums, uh, a lot is lost. And another challenge is that, uh, you know, uh, Canada, like many other countries in the world, has been um, dramatically affected by the colonial effort, uh, largely by the French and English in this, in this nation. And Indigenous peoples, cultures and knowledge systems have been compromised because of that. So um, the value of that knowledge to make sure that it remains um, as accurate and as useful for informing how people make decisions, it's important that the um, that programming built to support these indigenous ways of knowing doing um, are built to, for, to support the resurgence of knowledge systems going forward. So some of the stuff that Makeway likes to support uh, in order to address some of these barriers is as I mentioned, investing in indigenous cultural revitalization and intergenerational sharing programs, extremely important to sustain and rebuild these knowledge systems. Um, this uh, issue of, of, of policy making forms being fundamentally Western and bureaucratic and trying to uh, enable the self determination of Indigenous peoples to ensure that they are building their own decision making forms and governance systems and retaking control over business decision making and policy in their territories. That's a big, uh, uh, an ongoing effort in this country. And finally, um, you know, it's very important that those elders and land users and hunters that Laurie spoke about are able to live full time on the land and maintain that relationship and ensure that their the, the depth of their skill remains extremely high. So facilitating livelihoods that are related to the sustainable stewardship of intact land and marinescapes is, is extremely critical. So making sure that these these people don't, uh, aren't forced into economic activities that take them off of the land and therefore take them away from their cultural knowledge. So um, we'll end it there, um, but to just um, to indicate that Lori and I will be um, hosting one of the breakout sessions and our theme will be focused on sort of gender dynamics um, with respect to indigenous and local knowledge promotion and transmission. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Laurie and Steve, uh, for that very interesting, um, <clears throat> those very interesting insights from uh, the Northwest Territories of Canada. And we are pivoting next um, towards South Asia. So um, uh, we're actually heading to Bangladesh and uh, Dorote and uh, Stefan. Um, I'll allow them to introduce themselves and they're going to tell us about their work with friendship. Welcome, Dorote and, and Stefan. Yes, hello. So, um, yeah, from the cold Arctic uh, regions, we'll go to the uh, hot regions uh, of uh, Bangladesh uh, and present a completely different uh, context uh, 
of what friendship is actually doing in uh, in Bangladesh for for the remote community. So in Bangladesh, uh, in remote and unaddressed communities of Bangladesh, it's very difficult to define the very specific indigenous knowledge. Actually, their knowledge depends on a whole set of uh, cultural, social norms, environmental conditions, our economic practices, our agricultural practices. So bridging the gap with uh, local decision making for appropriate climate adaptation measures is actually taking into account all these social norms, uh, environmental context, but also taking into account the opinions, the needs, uh, and the vulnerability of these communities. Uh, what I say, what I would say, is, is actually really taking into account the reality of the community, so, because no policy for climate adaptation can be implemented. It correctly, uh, if this, if all the living conditions and values are not considered, and if the people within the communities don't understand the benefits for them, so this is on on this on this big picture that uh, the idea of this presentation is actually to show some pr very practical solutions that friendship is implementing to actually match the reality of the communities in remote areas of Bangladesh with the local decision makers. Uh, as you all know, Bangladesh is one of the most vulnerable country to climate change, floods, cyclones, and everything. It's, uh, it's, it's a common uh, uh, known that Bangladesh is, is very vulnerable. And the government of Bangladesh is actually very aware of this vulnerability. Uh, for Bangladesh, climate adaptation is really key for the country's development and future prosperity. Uh, as approved, there are many strategic plans, um, and Bangladesh has a lot of experience uh, regarding climate adaptation. Uh, I have put a list, I will not go into the details of all, but just for example, the Bangladesh Climate Change Strategy and Action Plan sets out 44 plans to be taken by the country over the short, medium, and long term. So. The, the, the policy for climate adaptation uh, in Bangladesh is probably one of the best in the world, but actually the implementation of this policy is sometimes difficult um, because uh, of different things. Like the first one is, of course, the geographical condition in some very remote uh, communities on, uh, on, on uh, river islands. Uh, the communities are so remote, unaddressed, almost forgotten, there is nothing there, no infrastructure, nothing. So it's it's kind of they're forgotten and, and it's difficult to implement a, 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 even a climate change adaptation policy that is really needed, but it's so far that, that it's very difficult. Also the high population density makes sometimes uh, implementation of policies and, 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 and measures for climate adaptation really difficult uh, because the pressure on the environment by the population is sometimes very high. In Bangladesh, there is also a limited institutional capacity. Although they're willing to do a lot of things, they are limited sometimes in, 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 in means, in funds, and they cannot do everything that they want. Uh, sometimes also in communities, the, the, there is too low uh, participation in, these, uh, in the measures taken for climate adaptation. And uh, it results in an inadequate uh, process in the decision making, not going, uh, doing the right things at the right place. So it's difficult for an organization like Friendship to have an impact on these uh, three points in blue, but it's uh, most easy to, to have an impact on, on the points uh, highlighted in green. And that's, that's what I will show uh, here. To empower the communities to efficiently address climate change, and have a say in local government decision making. So Friendship has put in place a, a whole series of mechanism tools that are generally uh, more organizational and participatory. So the idea is really to put the focus on the local needs, to increase the participation of the local people. Of course, put the women at the, the forefront because there are uh, often, uh, unfortunately, women are those suffering the most when there are disasters. Uh, so it's important that they, they should take some leadership in climate adaptation. So we really put a focus on women, involving them. Those very simple tools, um, organizational tools that I will explain in a few minutes, uh, to really the, the trust between all the stakeholders and 
stakeholders are mainly the communities and the local, the local government. So the first uh, initiative taken by Friendship is what we call CIDRR, it's Community Initiated Disaster Risk Reduction. Uh, Quite simple, it's actually uh, groups of people working together to achieve more together than what they could do individually. Each and every individual has some knowledge and skills, and, and these skills taken together can uh, contribute to prevent uh, crisis. And we mobilize the, the, the people through what we call friendship disaster management committees. They meet every month. We have the local people, the local government, people from the team of friendship and also uh, local elites, uh, local uh, people from different, uh, also different uh, uh, committees, uh, government committees like the Union Disaster Management Committees. It's, it's a government committees, but they're acting maybe on a, in a different area. And so we make all these people come together, talk, think, uh, find solutions, see where are the problem, uh, and, and together they can draw uh, some, some, some plans and find solutions so that really the, the, the usually remote and unheard vulnerable communities, they get more interest from the local government and they're able to put together a plan to respond to disaster. And by involving, uh, involving um, uh, government uh, responsible people, uh, sometimes we have very surprising outcomes like, for example, uh, members of the Union Disaster Management Committees, uh, they did not hesitate to take immediate decision to solve problems that were raised during these meetings. Uh, a very efficient tool for, uh, uh, for disaster preparedness is actually uh, this uh, participatory disaster risk assessment, is actually making a list of the main hazards, vulnerabilities to natural disasters in the communities. Uh, and you include the knowledge of the communities, you include um, uh, their, uh, their needs, the situation, the, the very particularities of, the, of each village, uh, and you prepare um, a plan, you find mitigation measures so that you really create, uh, you build the plan together uh, also with the, the authorities so that you really create an ownership and you strengthen the cohesion within the communities. And this is, and solidarity is very, very much important when a disaster strikes, because you're sure that the response is adequate and, 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 and everyone knows its role. Uh, very quickly, this is a summary that is, uh, uh, you, you see everything. So the blue triangle is actually the different phases. So you have preparedness, you have the response and rehabilitation, and at the top you have the transition to development, Actually, this is the resilience. And to achieve that, you, you, you blend everything and you blend these actions with three main actors who are uh, the NGO friendship, the community, and the local government. Another tool that is quite efficient to, to address uh, uh, climate vulnerabilities in the communities uh, is poverty maps. Uh, which are drawn with the communities to identify the geographical and infrastructural barriers uh, to their livelihoods and incomes. It's locally specific on e in each community, in each village. They identify, for example, a broken bridge, a broken road, or a lack of, of market uh, that will uh, strengthen their vulnerability and their uh, um, uh, to, to, to climate change and disaster. And, and with this map, they identify the problems the solutions, and they have a very clear tool to go to the local authorities and say, okay, here, if you repair this road, if you build a market at this place, you're sure the impact is great, you're sure the communities will be happy and they will be able to, to face the climate uh, change or the climate disaster. So it's very uh, uh, a very uh, nice uh, advocacy tool. Uh, another uh, group uh, is the Friendship Civil Society Groups. Uh, it's actually um, a way to blend traditional practices, social, uh, old tra uh, social norms, because in these communities you have, you know, a kind of heritage of how the uh, community and, and, and the society is structured with kind of uh, hierarchy, traditions, and you blend these traditional practices 
with modern knowledge and with modern concepts like uh, prevention of early marriage, prevention of domestic violence, uh, also access to uh, government support because sometimes the community are not even aware that they are in, entitled to receive support from the government and we make them aware that they, they can get social safety net and with more income there, they're more uh, pro prosperous and they can face any, any disaster that could strike. And, and these groups also create effective link between government institution and local communities. Another tool that we use is actually word meetings. So again, we gather people together uh, in, in words and, and they can express their view on the budget uh, of, the, of the local government. So they can make suggestion to, uh, so that the budget is designed in a way that they will also benefit from uh, the actions taken by the local government, because sometimes the budget is made enough is made in uh, government offices very far away from the communities, and it's not that they they don't want to help them, but they ju just don't think that these people may need something. So it's actually bringing uh, marginalized people or direct voice into the the, the government decision making. Uh, another way to to uh, uh, that for the, another thing that friendship is doing is is very simple. It's a scorecard rating the the the, the quality and the performance of the official uh, service providers. So the service they receive for the government, they give a score, and so it helps the uh, government to improve their services and also to to uh, address to to meet the expectation of the the, the recipients of these services. I will come to my conclusion. So friendship is really creating platforms and tools to ensure effective cooperation between communities and local governments. Communities, they have no a say in decision-making processes. They are empowered for better climate adaptation. And the go local government, they're also very often happy to be able to fulfill their commitment because sometimes they were just not not like they've not done well, but they were not aware and, and know they can take into consideration the remote communities. And all this coming together, it helps to implement the national plans that I have explained in the beginning uh, and, and, and achieve a really uh, to implement the national plans at a local level. So yeah, thank you for listening. Uh, I hope it was interesting and I will finish with the breakout group discussion that we will uh, facilitate, Dorothy will facilitate that. Maybe you want to, uh, Dorothy, to just... Uh, uh, yes, I can, I can pick it up from here. Uh, Stefan, thank you for your presentation. And uh, as you said, indeed, it's a very different context as uh, what Steve and Laurie were presenting, but uh, very exciting to see that there are the main messages uh, co come down to, the, to, to exactly the same. And I look forward to uh, have a, a, a breakout session uh, where we can see, you know, uh, and and learn from what uh, are our successes and failures and how then we make sure that um, that everything uh, our communities know um, and have experienced that. Uh, how can we bring that into decision making by uh, local and uh, national government? Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Dorothe and Stefan. And so you've seen that question for breakout group two. So if that is a tempting one for you, think about uh, following them into the second group. Our final presentation then is from uh, Martin Oulu from University of uh, Nairobi and Inkscape uh, Research. And uh, Martin is going to, we're going to continue moving west. We'll, we'll fly over the Indian Ocean and land in Kenya. So welcome, Martin. Um, thank you very much, uh, Tom. <clears throat> um, so thank you uh, very much once again, everyone, for having me. Uh, my name is Martin Ulu. I'm a lecturer at the University of Nairobi, uh, and I also work um, in a, a research and consulting firm that's called uh, Inskip. Um, so I just make uh, a presentation here on uh, uh, based on a research that we did together with Tom. Uh, it's called Foundations for Convergence, 
uh, subnational collaboration on the nexus of climate change, GIR, and land restoration under multi-level governance um, in Kenya. Uh, and uh, so basically we were trying to understand how um, uh, devolved uh, governments uh, in Kenya or county governments deal with uh, the three issues uh, of climate change adaptation, uh, disaster risk reduction, and land restoration. So how do they uh, integrate uh, these three uh, issues uh, at the local government level. Um, and some of the things that we found out was, for example, that uh, there is a very uh, decentralized uh, stakeholder landscape. Um, so there's a lot of uh, stakeholders who are uh, you know, actively involved in, in, in this space, uh, but they're us loosely uh, organized around uh, the National uh, Disaster Management Authority, which is a national body. Uh, but the, there's also the county steering uh, group that brings sort of together both the national, uh, county or local government uh, and also civil societies uh, together. Uh, another thing that we found out was that um, you know, national commitments really do not uh, infringe on the um, sort of the autonomy of local governments to prioritize their own activities. So they have the leeway to sort of uh, prioritize what activities they want to do uh, without necessarily feeling that uh, the national commitments are forcing them to do those things that they otherwise not do. Uh, and we also found that um, there's a lot of informal and formal uh, knowledge and information sharing uh, but there are still challenges um, there. Um, <clears throat> so just an overview of some of the legal framework that sort of shape uh, public participation uh, in adaptation in Kenya. Uh, so we have a new constitution since 2010 and the constitution is quite progressive. Uh, it provides for uh, you know a lot of areas uh, which sort of enhances uh, public participation, including uh, use of indigenous knowledge uh, in decision making. Um, so one of the, the things, I mean, it introduces the devolved system. So we have about 47, you can call them local government or counties. Um, and one of the objectives of, of that devolution is to enhance participation of people in the exercise of the powers of the state. Um, so the role of science and indigenous technology is uh, recognized by the state uh, and that the state is supposed to put in place uh, affirmative action programs, uh, which are intended to ensure that minorities and marginalized groups actually take part uh, in, in, in governance. And public participation has become a very critical aspect of you know, national values and, and principles of governance. And uh, this is something that has been reinforced by many uh, you know, courts, uh, the aspect of public participation. Uh, we also have the Protection of uh, Traditional Knowledge and Cultural Expressions Act. Uh, but unfortunately, the act is more uh, focused on you know, how to uh, uh, deal with the issues of traditional knowledge, especially in terms of access and the benefit sharing of the knowledge, um, rather than how that knowledge is to be used uh, in decision making. Uh, but we also have county public participation guidelines. Uh, and in terms of climate change, there is a Climate Change Act 2016. Uh, which requires the application of indigenous knowledge related to climate change adaptation. Uh, while formulating the National Climate Change Action Plan. Uh, communities are also represented in the Climate Change Council. So this is sort of the highest national body that uh, uh, manages issues of climate change. Uh, but of course, we know uh, there's a difference between what's uh, in, in papers, in constitutions, in laws, uh, and what is actually being implemented on the ground. Um, so this is what we were trying to understand the inter interactions between the disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. 
Uh, but we introduced another third dimension, which is uh, land restoration. Uh, and for us, this was very interesting because um, the land uh, restoration or, or, or dimension uh, sort of bridges short-term risk reduction and the long-term livelihood adaptation. And in the three counties that we were working on, that's uh, in Kitui, Makweni, and uh, Kajiado, uh, we found that you know the land restoration aspect actually uh, builds on 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 a lot of years of experience and indigenous knowledge, uh, and a lot of confidence that communities have in terms of managing uh, land resources, and so they see that land restoration aspect as very key to them in bringing together the climate change adaptation aspect, uh, as well as the disaster risk uh, reduction aspect. Um, and so land restoration was also very strong because uh, a lot of it is locally led. So uh, the communities uh, have been, uh, you know, working in these areas, uh, implementing some of these, uh, you know, land restoration activities like sand dams. Um, and so that is a very good or strong opportunity for them to bring on board uh, their indigenous knowledge. Uh, and that gets taken up in terms of uh, the projects that they are implementing. Um, so in terms of uh, where various institutions uh, work, uh, what we found is that um, a lot of the uh, organizations actually uh, are not working alone. So in whatever space they are working, they find that this uh, already either a national institution uh, doing the same thing or something complementary, or county governments or uh, already uh, working in, in, in such areas as well as civil uh, society organization. Uh, so essentially, uh, because of um, the nexus in which they work, uh, there's a lot of potential uh, for collaboration between uh, different institutions and different uh, stakeholders. Um, we also looked at some of the, the partnerships uh, and, uh, you know, sort of the power uh, and influence pyramids. Um, so what we found out was that uh, many of the organizations actually, uh, the top tier in the pyramid is, is, is those uh, organizations that sort of uh, give policy direction. Uh, but also um, influence, uh, make, have influence in terms of funding. Uh, so a lot of the institutions actually uh, believe or found that they actually work uh, in those two key areas. Um, not many organizations say they only implement uh, activities, which is um, uh, the bottom uh, part of the pyramid. Uh, if you look at Kitui County, for example, there is no institution that mentioned that they are only implementers. Um, so essentially, all or most of the institutions feel that uh, they are able to influence decisions, uh, and they're also able to chip in and contribute some, some resources uh, in order to implement uh, either the activities that they work on jointly or those that they work on uh, as individual institutions. Uh, and also, so that therefore also uh, shows that there's a lot of potential for, 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 for collaboration uh, and working together. Um, so in terms of uh, how, uh, you know, vertical and uh, horizontal integration, um, there are uh, a few organizations uh, that are very critical in sort of trying to uh, bridge the gap uh, as, as, as hubs. So one of them I already mentioned is the National uh, Drought Management Authority. Uh, but apart from that, there is the county steering group, uh, groups that sort of bring together not only the national government, but also the county government and also uh, civil society organizations. Um, so that's an opportunity where uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, joint thinking, joint planning, uh, you know, bringing together resources uh, that they share and which they can then use uh, to implement some of the uh, activities that we implement. And uh, at the lower levels, we have the ward development committees, uh, 
uh, where uh, a lot of times uh, the communities uh, get to get involved in, in, in decision making, or at least uh, their ideas get heard. Um, we found very interesting uh, cases, for example, in Makweni, where uh, the communities uh, actually approve uh, projects that are to be implemented. They monitor and evaluate, um, and even in cases where um, uh, contractors are to be paid for before that happens, uh, the communities have to give, uh, you know, the the okay for that to happen. Um, but this differs across uh, counties. There are some counties which are uh, the communities are not much uh, involved. But uh, through this system, uh, we see that. There are attempts uh, to involve local communities uh, and uh, find ways in which the three areas of climate change uh, adaptation, disaster risk reduction, and land restoration uh, can actually be integrated. And another thing that we found was that at, at the community levels, uh, especially the, 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 the ward levels where most projects get implemented, um, it's almost uh, not very easy to tell what aspect is climate change adaptation and what is disaster risk reduction and what is uh, land restoration because for the communities, they see problems as problems and for them, they would want th those problems solved. So if it's a water access to water problem, uh, they do not separate and see, well, this is caused by climate change, land risk uh, degradation. Uh, and so on. Um, and so you see uh, a much more, you know, closer uh, integration of the three aspects as compared to, for example, at the national level. Um, so just to summarize, uh, some of these, uh, uh, some of the things that we saw, especially in terms of uh, indigenous knowledge and uh, CDR's integration, is that uh, CBOs and the community members are represented and to do participate in, in, in uh, decision making. Uh, but sometimes, uh, you know, the level of participation and, and how much their voice uh, gets to influence decision uh, differ across counties uh, by could of course always be enhanced. Um, counties have uh, sort of the leeway and, and the autonomy to, 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 to um, prioritize their activities and plans. Uh, so we did see, uh, you know, national commitments, you know, um, affecting that very much. Uh, but of course, there's need uh, to consider sort of the range of overlapping agendas, uh, which sometimes have different funders and so on. Uh, and find ways in which you know we can uh, institutions can uh, work together across these different agendas, uh, funders, and so on uh, to sort of enhance uh, the synergies. Uh, there are ongoing efforts to sort of formalize some of these uh, collaborations or institutional framework that we found out were sort of loose. Uh, loose. Um, but of course, um, sometimes trying to formalize might be, be, become counterproductive. So um, while there are attempts to sort of have these formalized, uh, we still don't know whether that would be uh, the best approach or, or, or not. Uh, another thing that we found is that uh, there is knowledge uh, sharing and information uh, sharing, uh, both informal and structured. Um, is structured mainly through the early warning bulletins and so on. Uh, but indigenous knowledge is still shared informally. Um, and uh, I think uh, one of the presenters already mentioned that there's still that sort of resistance to include uh, indigenous knowledge uh, into formal decision making systems. Uh, so you might find that, you know, communities are represented, they hold uh, they are bearers of the indigenous knowledge, uh, but when uh, you know decisions are made, uh, they tend to go with a uh, more scientific uh, and formal um, knowledge systems. Um, some of the challenges that we found: uh, there is always risk in collaboration uh, because of things like lack of rules of engagement. Uh, how do you engage when you have conflict? How you do you deal with 
uh, these conflicts and so on. Uh, and then there is uh, the poor access to and expertise in using climate change pro projections for the region. Uh, and of course, this also goes to indigenous knowledge. Uh, we have communities that are able to predict rain, for example. Uh, but like I said, uh, a lot of times, um, you know, we tend to want to go with the scientific, uh, you know, um, projections rather than uh, the more indigenous based systems. Uh, there's also no uh, centralized platform for sharing uh, the information. Um, so this is something that means, uh, I mean, uh, because of that lack of a centralized platform, uh, getting information about indigenous knowledge uh, um, and so on and, and using them uh, becomes a challenge. Uh, and of course, uh, no formalized way of preserving and uh, uh, accessing the indigenous knowledge. Now we have, um, for example, the National Museums that tries to do this, uh, but of course there's still that challenge of, you know, how do you access it? Uh, what are the rights uh, that the communities have? And there's always that fear that, uh, you know, the indigenous knowledge might be misused. Uh, um, so there's still a lot of controversies about how to access and utilize that uh, indigenous knowledge. Um, so the breakout uh, discussion uh, is going to facilitate is uh, what sort of partnerships or coalitions. Great. Excellent. Thank you so much, Martin. And um, I'm going to, we're running just a, a little bit behind. I'm going to go ahead and open up those breakout rooms. Um, but before you take off, let me just um, share my screen with you again. And you'll see all three of the breakout group questions. So we've got three questions. And again, as, as a reminder, um, Lisa and Steve, um, how do we integrate customary and local knowledge into local government uh, and, and enable gender transformation? Um, Stefan and Dorote, how can customary knowledge be integrated to ensure local governments leave no one behind? So broader questions about inclusion. And then um, the third group uh, with Martin and I, partnerships and coalition building, thinking about uh, what partnerships or coalitions work best in promoting uh, integration of, of indigenous and traditional knowledge and subnational uh, policy making. So I think there are questions about policy and responsive policy that cut across these. Uh, and I think it'd be interesting to explore, you know, I, I think in the Bangladesh and Kenya context, you know, sometimes we have very progressive um, policies uh, at the national level, but, you know, implementation in the local dynamics uh, can still be a bit challenging. So how important are those uh, broader national policy uh, frameworks in uh, shaping those local dynamics. So the breakout groups are open. So I would ask everybody should be able to file into the group um, that, that they've chosen, the uh, co-hosts, the um, uh, leaders of those discussions should be able to go into the uh, breakout groups. If you see a group that looks like it's a bit overpopulated, you might want to choose a smaller group just so we get an even distribution so we don't end up with uh, breakout groups that are, um, are really tiny and others that are are really large. Welcome back to the 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 main uh, session. Uh, I hope you had a stimulating discussion in your breakout group. Um, we're going to give our uh, rapporteurs from the breakout group just a couple minutes uh, if they want to put together just a, a, a few uh, highlights to share. And then we can perhaps have some kind of uh, intergroup uh, observations or some, some uh, additional questions that we can then uh, sort of open it up into more of a, a forum. Um, as they're doing that, uh, we actually have a, a Mentimeter. I've never done this before. This is new to me, but um, we'll see how it goes. Uh, so as we're waiting just a couple of minutes here while our um, Folks, get ready to give us a, a quick uh, recap of those breakout group discussions. 
uh, we have this question uh, for Mentimeter. And so uh, the question is what prevents local government from engaging with traditional knowledge systems to guide adaptation? Very often we have uh, very progressive NGOs that are articulating um, you know, the need to incorporate um, local knowledge, indigenous knowledge systems um, into adaptation planning. Um, what about on the government side? Um, what are some of the obstacles for sort of deeper government recognition and engagement around issues of knowledge systems? And so if you go to menti.com on your phone or on your computer, whatever device you have in front of you, enter 58619842. Uh, you should see this um, question pop up and you can put in a short answer to that question if you'd like to do that. Okay. And once we hear back from our uh, breakout group rapporteurs, uh, we'll see what uh, what kinds of um, kind of uh, rapid the, the, responses we got. Uh, Thomas, excuse me, the, the, the code doesn't work for Menti. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, maybe I have to have it. Um, yes, the code is not working. Ah, I see they've, they've actually changed the code. Um, so that must have, so this is a screen share. So I'm going to now, let me, let me share the, the current one. Okay, so four, two, five, eight. One six five six. Apologies for that. Four two five eight. One six five six. Okay. Um, so let's see. So in our first uh, breakout group, um, did you? elect or appoint a someone to uh, report back? We didn't quite get around to that, but uh, our time expired, but I'll just be the rapporteur, I suppose. Okay, so you'd like to give us a quick uh, recap, Steve? Yeah, I guess um, uh, two main points I think we discussed is that the first is that I think uh, often um, organizations or NGOs or whatever it might be that are uh, providing some sort of intervention in a community and are approaching it from a gender lens are trying to amplify women and girls' voices or provide more opportunities for women and girls or provide more equity to women and girls. Uh, but that's not always the case. And certainly we discussed that sometimes the inequity or the um, lack of opportunity is, is more slanted towards men. So that's, uh, that's one theme that we talked about. I think another key theme was that um, interventions that might be uh, in the interest of generating gender equity um, outcomes may sometimes generate negative outcomes with respect to local self-determination and um, cultural integrity and vice versa. Uh, initiatives that may be there to promote local custom and local um, traditional integrity or cultural integrity may sometimes be at odds with the objectives of cultural diversity and navigating um, those um, um, sometimes uncomplimentary outcomes um, can be a challenge and, and people need to be mindful of that. So I'll just leave it there. And I think that sort of captures the main things we were talking about. Excellent, very good recap. Yeah, for sure. We um, sometimes talk about indigenous and, and local knowledge systems um, without recognizing how differentiated they are and, and thinking about um, uh, difference within, within communities. And certainly that's um, very important. So thanks for that recap, Steve. Um, uh, over to you, uh, Dorothy, would you like to uh, give us some highlights from, your, from the second breakout group? Yes, we had an interesting discussion as well in our group. Um, I think that if you want to bring in um, indigenous knowledge into the decision making, it, it works from two sides. So first of all, from the community side, you have uh, you, you need to really bring in 
uh, their their knowledge and their experience and uh, and their voice basically. And uh, so, in in order to do that, they have to be recognized, and uh, and there has to be some form of uh, how how we listen to them and um, and how we can make sure that they they get a seat at the decision making uh, table. Um, sometimes they need to be mobilized. You know, there needs to be some somebody that uh, that brings the communities together and, and, and gets the information and the data uh, that, that are in the communities available to bring it out and, and bring it to the, to the right uh, instances uh, uh, to, to take it into the decision making. So that comes not by itself, but we need to look at how we can mobilize uh, the communities. And um, if you look uh, at, the, at the side of the governments, there's a um, there's, there's also a lack of knowledge from the community side, so how the decision framework work, works in the government, in all the stages, you know, where, where is the data that we collect, where is it going, and, uh, and, and who is deciding what at what stage, and, and how, how does it come in the end to, to maybe the, the national level. Uh, so there's a, there's a lack of transparency, so there's a lack of understanding maybe from both sides, and if we can bridge that gap, that, that would uh, help. But to bridge that gap, you need also lots of trust. So trust building is, uh, is, uh, is important as well. So, um, and, um, and in the end, uh, accountability as well. If you, if you look through the stages, how, uh, how will we give the feedback uh, and, um, and how will yeah, the, the, the decisions that are made be be, be accountable uh, of, of, of the data and, and the input of the communities uh, where we started. So actually it's a, it's a process from both sides that is quite challenging. And uh, so you can, you can see how, how often that there can be hiccups in that whole process. Absolutely. Thank you for that excellent uh, recap. And I think we're seeing some of those uh, concerns as well uh, reflected in the in the Mentimeter, uh, these sort of uh, flash answers that are scrolling across, hopefully you're seeing those as well. Uh, issues around uh, trust and, um, you know, questions about who articulates um, uh, local and traditional knowledge. I think those are really, really very critical. Uh, thank you so much, Dorothee. And um, our third group, uh, group three, um, Nelly, I think was going to give us a, a short recap. Yes. Welcome. Yes. And so for group three, we were discussing how on what partnerships or coalitions work best in promoting the integration of indigenous knowledge into subnational policy making. And we had, you know, feedback uh, including as part of the preparatory stages, uh, assisting communities to understand that indigenous knowledge is very valuable. So going through the process of convincing them that indigenous knowledge is indeed key, and then further elaborating how, how their indigenous knowledge can be used into policy making. Uh, so creating awareness as, as the initial stage for that. And then the, there is also agreement that uh, this is a long-term process and therefore it requires long-term investment. So just to uh, be aware that you know this is probably not something that you can um, realize in, in in the short term, but rather it needs to be long term planning and long term investments. Uh, there was an example given of our tripartite partnerships that have worked in other parts of the world, uh, particularly composed of community, local government, and NGOs, uh, and there has been some great successes in such tripartite partnerships. Uh, so there's potential for this to be replicated um, uh, in other countries as well. Then in terms of uh, scale, there was also another ex example given uh, of the Southern CSO's uh, network, which is a network of um, CSO's in the glo global south, composed of national and subnational networks, and they focus on advocacy and monitoring and implementation of policy. So in a sense, they're able to share experiences and lessons learned from the different countries and different continents and uh, able to replicate best practices and staying away for you know, things that don't, don't work. And then uh, 
There was also feedback that uh, for such partnerships to work, it's important to build partnerships that are based on trust and, and holistic approaches, uh, since uh, holistic approaches uh, usually you know, deal with uh, uh, a whole lot more issues than individual issues. Uh, in a sense, this is going to be able to reach out to uh, more people, more communities, and more needs. So useful to have you know, building the trust and then uh, dealing with a whole range of issues based on the context. And then the last feedback that we received is that uh, undertaking community vulnerability assessments with the community has also been a useful tool in terms of helping the community to understand what their vulnerabilities are and further uh, helping them to design ideas for addressing the, the challenges that they are having. And so taking them through the whole process of understanding what the challenge is and then designing the interventions uh, to get their buy and to fully bring them on board. So very, very uh, varied uh, feedback, but, uh, but I think the, just to summarize is to say that uh, such partnerships do work. They can work at different scales, at a community, local government scale, as well as intercontinental scale. Thank you, Tom. Over to you. Oh, excellent. Thank you so much, Nelly. That was really um, an excellent um, report. You captured a lot. And um, I think it's clear that there are a lot of, um, you know, different elements of, the, of this discussion, um, <clears throat> you know, not all of which touch directly on uh, the question of policy. And I think that to me is still sort of an open question about, you know, how important is that broader, you know, policy framework and policy advocacy um, relative to maybe the kinds of local efforts that people are doing or that organizations are doing, uh, perhaps to sensitize local government in, in a much more uh, direct way, um, even in the absence of a kind of a more progressive um, uh, policy framework. So um, we have some time now. We don't have a lot. We're <laughs> a little bit behind, but uh, we do have about 10 minutes remaining. And so uh, since we're all uh, back together, I thought uh, we could um, have an opportunity for folks to uh, ask questions if you want to ask questions of any of the uh, presenters uh, from earlier in the session. Uh, if there's a point that you'd like to, uh, you know, try to ident identify maybe some connections between the, the uh, breakout groups, um, that would be most welcome as well. So we can sort of open the floor for discussion. And I'm going to, uh, let's see, I'll look at my participant list here for folks. If you want to just raise your hand and try to try to call on you and I'll stop sharing here. Questions for for any of our uh, presenters or uh, sort of issues that you felt were perhaps not not quite resolved coming out of your breakout groups. Yes, uh, I see Edel. Yes, hi. Um, I had a question uh, for the first presenters, uh, Stephen Laurie. And I can remember uh, that you mentioned that one of the um, ways to overcome the challenges that you mentioned was uh, developing self-determined governance systems. I was wondering uh, when these are developed, how did they interact with the more yeah, Western, I don't know how to phrase this, but more Western governance systems and how did the interaction uh, evolve? Thank you. Yeah, it's a big question. I, th I think the, I would just say that there's a number of um, emerging or established self-governing indigenous organizations or nations in, in this country. They're sort of nations within nations. Um, they are very new and how they intersect with sort of 
state governments and public governments is very much a work in progress, but effectively they've taken on a lot of the roles and responsibilities with respect to land management, education, health, social services, so on and so forth. Uh, but they are very much in the forming days and though on paper they are taking over lots of responsibilities, it will be a multi-generational effort to actually make that happen. Um, all that being said is that there are a number of, of these self-governing Indigenous nations arising in the country, um, primarily out of negotiated arrangements with the federal government of Canada. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adele, for that question. Other questions for our contributors for, um, for this session? I know for many of you, it's been a long day of conferencing uh, already, maybe evening where you are. Um, but take a deep breath and See if we have uh, some additional discussion between that might connect some of the uh, issues that we've talked about so far. Or if someone would also like to share um, uh, an example of a uh, success in terms of centering local knowledge and the work that their organization does, um, or a particular challenge that you found that, you know, something that maybe inspired your, your Mentimeter comment, um, I would welcome that as well. Yes, Chris, I see your virtual yellow hand is raised. Welcome. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I find um, in venues like this, we, I think we all believe and understand the potential of indigenous knowledge, ancestral knowledge. Invariably, it's not being used and respected. I, I think this is why we come to the conference and try and present our evidence. Um, and and uh, in one of the other sessions we're attending tomorrow, we're suggesting that the solution is combining knowledge you know it's 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 bringing people together and combining knowledge so to try and move forward so to sort of like to get rid of the polarization and the camps um in this and i still think that is pragmatic way forward and especially perhaps to try and do that recognizing that in a lot of contexts people are operating in market systems where decision making is sort of like by entrepreneurs and private sector actors, and and they 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 want to do that. I mean, I think that's what I was looking for in today's session. I didn't hear too much of that. I saw it more about what government can do, what local government can do, what institutions can do. Um, but I think that private sector angle needs to be explored more. We are trying to explore it with market systems facilitation where you bring together actors and get them to talk about how to use those market systems and use knowledge. But it's still at risk, the problem, because as soon as you do that, it's a push then towards more technology transfer and external non-Indigenous knowledge, which then compromises the Indigenous no no local knowledge. I just thought I'd share that. Um, thank, thank you, Chris. And your, your organization? Your... Practical Action, work with Practical Action. Maria Goss is here. She's from Zimbabwe, and she could probably talk to about seed systems where this is particularly the case. Uh, because as soon as you try to sort of get that indigenous knowledge and seed systems, which vulnerable and min you know ethnic minorities use, I think it's either can even be proprietary taken over. I mean, it can be patented and use that knowledge, and then it suddenly becomes inaccessible. Yeah, she might say something about that. Thank you, Chris. Um, yes, Sam, I see your, your hands up. Welcome. 
Yeah, um, yeah, I thought I might share an experience and a challenge from northern Kenya, actually. So um, there is a, a set of work that is now known as the County Climate Change Funds in Kenya, which started as a pilot program in Isiolo. Uh, the aim being to try to bring together local planning with uh, finance, to sort of bring those things together so that the planning has a purpose. I mean, there were vulnerability assessments, which integrated the local knowledge um, uh, with local Burana and Somali communities in Wajir. And they did quite a good job of, uh, similar to the work, in, to work also done in Tanzania, integrating the, the local knowledge. And that pilot expanded and expanded, and now it has World Bank funding and is being scaled up nationwide. Now, that's great. So now there is at least in principle a process for community participation that has finance at the end of it. The problem, the challenge is in scaling up, um, there is a tendency to dilute the planning processes that integrate the local knowledge because they're seen as time consuming, they're more expensive. Uh, the focus ends up being on the finance and then not the planning that ensures that there is quality to the finance. So there is a, an interesting trade-off, I think, between the the, the setting up a system which can institutionalize the integration of indigenous knowledge into planning with the scaling it up nationwide where the old uh, prejudice isn't the right word, but assumptions about what's important come back into play. Um, I thought it was quite an interesting experience to share. I'm very happy to share something like that uh, um, if anybody's interested. Yeah, very important example. And if you just you know, do a, a search for country climate change funds, Kenya, you'll find a, quite, quite a lot of very interesting resources out there. Um, clock is ticking down, Maria's hand is up. Maria, would you like to uh, uh, make, make your comment here in our closing minutes? <laughs> no, Welcome. thank you so much uh, for giving me this opportunity. No, I just wanted to uh, just share a few experiences in Zimbabwe. We've been trying to get um, to document uh, the evidence and get all the players who are into this nature-based solutions and indigenous knowledge systems so that we can provide the evidence which uh, policymakers are always asking that you always say that pharmaceutical seeds varieties work, but where's the evidence? So we formed an, a, a community of practice and we've been trying to document. And that has influenced uh, the, the government enough uh, for us to come up with, uh, we are in the process of developing an agroecology and organic farming policy under which these uh, indigenous knowledge systems and farmer money systems are being uh, considered. But the thing is uh, influencing the policy and getting it to be accepted and adopted uh, like some real said, we end up uh, losing some of the aspects because policymakers want the strategy to come out in a particular way and these have been practicing these um, technologies, uh, community-based technologies in response to the climate uh, impacts and also in response to how they've been building resilience for decades. But uh, partners and other stakeholders really need to be influenced in terms of listening and taking cognizance of community needs and not just trying to impose issues. So I think that that is something which is really uh, of concern and I don't know how we can start influencing that uh, positively and getting the policymakers to really sit up and listen to what the communities need and not what they think is needed. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Maria. And that really resonates with um, much of the discussion in, in, in Breakout Group 3, um, which sort of touched also on, you know, sort of uh, communities having confidence to kind of, um, you know, uh, bring their suggestions or their ideas to the table that in, in some cases, you know, sort of what might be considered local or traditional knowledge system, you know, has such a long, long history, right? Centuries old history in some cases of being kind of marginalized, pushed to the side, uh, not really part of the conversation of development. And so um, 
this is a this is a, a very long-standing uh, challenge, and in many cases, this is kind of a historical um, sort of uh, challenge that many societies face. Um, all right. Well, um, I don't see any other hands up. Um, I think we've covered quite a lot of territory, a lot to think about. Oh, I, I uh, see Aisha. Aisha would like to jump in and perhaps have our last word here um, this afternoon. Uh, um, um... Chris Henderson was saying something about the the private uh, side of uh, you know participation. Uh, in Bangladesh, there is uh, something called the PPP, which is the private public private participation in development. So they take on not community uh, you know based policy making, but definitely they are participating in big development projects like building bridges, uh, building dams, building the like Delta plan. So there is a certain amount of public and private well partnership in Bangladesh that's happening. Perhaps we could expect a little more from the private sector, definitely. But uh, it's my it's a feeling I feel that and also that I do see that in Bangladesh, there is a big hesitance in, in the private sector becoming very involved in development. So, um, so that was my little take in uh, from what Mr. What Chris Anderson was saying. So yeah, so that's my thought. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Aisha. And um, certainly there, uh, we, you know, we do need to be thinking about Sort of private sector engagement, or you know, around these sorts of issues, um, you know, with uh, so much of the adaptation agenda, it's really uh, this, you know, um, increasingly, I would say, at the, at the local scale, this sort of, um, uh, you know, intersection of government and non-governmental and and uh, sort of private sector uh, interests and agendas um, that that we need to be mindful of. Um, we're we're over time, in fact. Um, so let me just uh, say that it's it's really been great engaging with all of you, and, and thanks for um, sticking with us through this session. Uh, thanks to Laurie and Steve from from Makeway, and Dorothy and Stefan from um, Friendship, as well as uh, Martin in Nairobi. Thanks to Sam Green for helping us to pull this session together. Really appreciate the uh, uh, guidance, and I look forward to seeing you all in. Uh, in a future session, uh, perhaps tomorrow. Great to meet many of you. Thanks very much.